part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hi, everybody. It's John Tellich from the Guardians of the Land MLB Podcast. Be sure to hop on with us to follow all the dramatic developments of the reigning American League Central Division champions. From game analysis to interviews to keeping tabs on who could be the next breakout star. We'll have that and much, much more right here. It's the Guardians of the Land MLB podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. Subscribe here and join the fun. Breakers, that sound means it's time for Cavs in the Break NBA podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. I'm your host, Chase Smith, and with me, the NBA writer for HoopsWire.com. He's our Cavs insider, national NBA writer, Sam Amico. Sam, that has been your intro since day one. Are you, are you cool with all that? Is that all good? Yeah, the website name keeps changing, but it does. Uh, mine is the same. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I like it. All right. You don't want to do Denny's Grand Slam card holder. You don't, you don't want me to add that to the to the intro? <laughs> no, we'll leave that one. Out. Okay. All right. All right. Here with us also, the man, the myth, the legend, my first podcast partner in crime, Jeremy and Akron, JIA. What's up, my man? Hey, what is up? You know, you know, it's a big show tonight because Sam broke out the glasses. Sam yes. looks like a real professional. Uh, he's he's ready to go, you know, and and he only does this when we have big time guests. I'll yeah. say that. That's that's very true. I want to make sure I get a good look at him. <laughs> Sam is look, looking great. John Sable sitting on the sidelines for this one. Something about covering sports at Fox Eight. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, TV. He, blah he, blah he's blah. A big guy. Uh, shouts to Zach for checking this pod out. We have a very special guest tonight, as Jeremy and Sam are allu- alluding to. He's the Cleveland Cavaliers radio play by play announcer. You know his voice well. Welcome him to the pod, Tim Alcord. And Tim, thanks for joining us on Cavs on the Break. And thank God you don't know my face well, because it's a face <laughs> for radio. I can tell you that. No, it's no. great to be with you guys. Uh, Sam and I, in my previous stop before the Cavaliers play-by-play gig, uh, had many, many conversations on a show that I did for WEOL Radio. So I would grill Sam out on the floor at uh, what was then the the queue and now Rock and Mortgage Fieldhouse. So uh, I'm sure Sam is just licking his chops, getting ready to <laughs> grill me uh, on a few things. Yeah, no, it's Sam, great to be with you guys. I appreciate it. Sam, how long do you and Tim go back? Gosh, I I, I started as a Cavs full time Cavs writer in 2007. So. I know Tim was at EOL then, but I think probably 2009, 10, somewhere in there. Wouldn't you say, Tim? Somewhere I would say um, easily because yeah. 07 was that Cavs finals year, correct? Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so I know we were doing the show sporadically uh, that season, and then uh, listeners seemed to like it, and uh, we were able to get terrific guests like Sam and others, and uh, so from that point on, it became more of a, a regular show. So, yeah, Sam, we go back a long way. Yeah. Wait, you look a lot older than you used to. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those things happen. I, uh, I, I, Tim, Tim would certainly tell you about some of my legendary uh, dining habits in the media dining room we used to talk about that quite a bit because tim would see me in there in line like two or three times and uh, and, uh yeah. that was my claim to fame so you're the reason they've gone to vouchers now at the concession yeah. stand. <laughs> <laughs> they would tell me all you can eat and and well, throw me dan out Gilbert anyway. was like that's too much sam amico's bankrupting me dan gilbert put a stop to that <laughs> yeah yeah. So, um, uh, but yeah, those, we go back quite a ways that those were, those were good times. It was a lot of fun going on that show. Um, I, it was before I even started at Fox sports. And I, I always, I remember thinking at one point, like in 2006 or so, you know, I want to be uh, a full-time Cavs writer and I want to do radio and television. 
Mm. And, and I don't know, you know, that sounds very shallow, but I remember thinking that's what I wanted to do. And at that point, uh, Tim, as you can relate at that point, and I loved it, but I wanted to, I wanted to cover the Cavs. But I, at that point, I was covering basically high school sports, um, you know, high school football, basketball. For me, it was even some golf and swimming and wrestling and track and doing all those things. And I can remember coming on your show on the court side. And that was the first time really that, you know, maybe maybe a month into the job covering the Cavs full time. And I remember sitting there thinking, you know, here I am. Here's here's what I wanted to do. And I'm right here on the court, which I'd never really been at that at, at, at that time you know, uh, quick and loads arena. I'd never been that close before. So <clears throat> I know I never expressed that to you, but that was a big moment for me going on WEOL with you guys. And, um, I always appreciated you guys having me on. So, and it's, it's great to have you here as well. Oh, thank you, Sam. I appreciate that. Yeah. We had a, a lot of fun on that show. And of course, uh, you and I were both very, very close uh, to my co-host Matt Lodi, uh, yeah. Matt and I were great friends, and I know you and Matt were very, very close. And uh, I'll, I'll give credit to Matt. It was Matt who said, uh, "You know, I've got this friend Sam Amico." I'm like, "Who? <laughs> <laughs> Sam Amico? We should have him on the show." And uh, no, it was it was terrific. And uh, I think about Matt a lot. I really do. Yeah. He's a great friend of both of ours, and uh, we had a lot of fun on that show. So. Uh, it brings back positive memories for me, so I'm glad it does for you as well. Those were great conversations. You're right. Yeah. T Tim, when did you start official? When when was your first year? Was it 2020 with the Cavs? So my first year, correct, was uh, the 1920 season. Uh, okay. Very sadly, uh, Fred McLeod uh, passed about three weeks before the season was to start, Uh had a fatal heart attack, so an, an unexpected passing, a tragic passing. And so the Cavaliers uh, moved, transitioned John Michael from radio to television. And to be honest, uh, I was stunned and, and flabbergasted when they reached out to me uh, and expressed interest in talking to me about doing radio play-by-play -play for the Cavaliers. And uh, it happened all so quickly because of the fact that uh, Fred passed in late September and our hour, the Cavs first game, uh, was mid October. Uh, so my life turned upside down in about <laughs> seven days time, uh, mm -hmm. from working at WEOL and doing high school football and, uh, actually running the station. I was the general manager of the station. And, uh, seven days later, I was in New York attending, uh, NBA broadcast meetings as the radio voice of the Cavs. It was, Wow. It was a surreal time. Did you expect, uh, like, was this something that you had applied for at one point, and and or did this just totally come out of the blue when you when you were offered the job? Was it? Um, well, the the first time the job opened, yeah, uh, was when Joe Tate retired, right. and so I did apply at that time. Uh, I applied for the job when Joe retired, and. Uh, I went pretty deep into the process. I uh, had several conversations uh, with the folks at then Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse and uh, had an opportunity to interview. And uh, I mentioned, you know, John Michael. Uh, John ended up getting the job. I know I was one of the finalists. Uh, I don't know if it came down to John and I, but um, but John got the job. And listen, John's very talented. And, and now that I've come on board with the Cavs, uh, he's become a great friend. I really get along very well with John. But uh, the, the second time, uh, as I said, was when uh, Fred sadly passed. And I, I did not, you know, apply for the job. Uh, Dave Dombrowski, uh, director of broadcasting for the Cavaliers, actually reached out to me. He sent me an email um, and it was it was an it was an odd email from my perspective because uh, it simply said I, I'd like as much of your work. Can you get me as much audio uh, as quickly as possible? I'm sure you're aware of Fred's passing, and uh, mm. and my my assumption was that the Cavaliers would just replace Fred on the television side that they would do a very yeah. quick search. 
So I thought, well, this is kind of strange. And obviously Dave didn't want to share with me what their plan was, was to transition John. Um, so I was like, well, this is odd, but sure. <laughs> and I, and I recall in the email reply saying, Dave, I don't have any television work. You know, I'm a, I'm a radio guy, but you know, here's some audio for you. And, uh, and as I said, things kind of transpired quickly after that. Yeah. Yeah. Where, how long were you at EOL? <laughs> 27 years. Yeah. I, I started at WEOL in 1992, uh, part-time, actually, just doing, Sam, you mentioned, you know, football and basketball and, you know, this and that, uh, just as a part-time basis. And then uh, the general manager at WEOL offered me a full-time job in sales. And I thought, you got to be crazy. Yeah, I'm not a sales <laughs> guy. Uh, but I was married and my wife and I had started a family and, um, I actually went to Joe Tate, uh, and said, you know, I want to talk to you about this because Joe and I had developed a relationship at that point. And, uh, you know, in, in a way that only Joe could say, uh, Timothy, you take that sales job and you run with it. And, uh, <laughs> That's fantastic. That sounded exactly like it. Actually. So I, uh, <laughs> I, got into, uh, I got into sales and then became the sales manager and, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the actual general manager of the station, I was running the day-to-day -day operation all the while still doing play-by-play. -play. So I had a, a pretty full plate, but 27 yeah. years there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, that has a similar ring to uh, what Terry Pluto told me when I was fresh out of college and my only job offer was in Rollins, Wyoming, uh, a town of 8,000. And, uh, you know, I'm an Akron, Ohio guy, so... I asked Terry, you know, what do, what do I do? And he said, well, you have a couple options. You can take that job or you can go work at Foot Locker. Which do you prefer? <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, you can be a sports writer or a shoe salesman, whichever, you, whichever you'd like. Yeah. So, yeah, that I took that message, moved to Wyoming. But were you originally from Northeast Ohio or upstate New York or – where? No, uh, my my route to Ohio and the Joe Tate Perch at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse uh, is a rather cir circuitous one. Uh, so, Sam, you mentioned Western New York. I was actually born uh, in between Buffalo and Rochester uh, okay. up in the Western New York area. And uh, people that know me or know of me, uh, I'm a huge Bills fan. Uh, I'm a Bills Mafia guy. It's, I've never had it disappear throughout my stops. Um, but I moved away, uh, our family moved away from Western New York uh, when I was about seven years old, and we moved up to the New England area. Uh, my dad was in the newspaper business, uh, not as a writer, uh, but more on the management side of things. So uh, he accepted a position uh, in New Hampshire at a newspaper there, uh, and then a, a few years later uh, at another newspaper uh, outside Providence, Rhode Island. So I was up in New England for about 10, 11 years and then came to Ohio when he accepted a position with uh, the Illyria Chronicle. If you know uh, Bob Finan, Rick Noland, yep. those guys. So yeah. um, so my dad took a position with the Chronicle. So I moved to Ohio when I was a junior in high school. So that's when I became an Ohioan and I've been here ever since. Nice. That's great. Uh, Tim, before we take a break, what advice uh, would you give to any young aspiring radio or TV broadcasters out there who uh, might be, you know, have dreams of of the of covering either a team or, or, or a big stage? What advice would you, would you give someone like that? Well, you know, as Sam and I both alluded to, uh, you're going to have to start somewhere uh, mm -hmm. and no matter how small it is approach that job with as much professionalism uh, and as much energy and as much passion as you would, uh, whether it's in Wyoming, Elyria, Ohio, or wherever it may be, um, because that's how you're going to really develop the building blocks of your profession. Uh, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. I, I can't begin to tell you how many mistakes I made as a young broadcaster, uh, but you'll learn from those. Uh, be be your own worst critic. Uh, go back and listen to your work. Uh, mm. I'm sure Sam with his writing and you guys with your audio, you go back and you listen to it. What do, yep. what do I like? What don't I like? Uh, go to others within your profession 
and say, you know, will you listen to my audio? Can you give me some pointers? Uh, Lord knows how many conversations Joe and I, Joe Tate and I had about that. We had a great relationship over the years, but uh, don't ever give up. Don't ever, ever give up. Uh, you never know when your break might come. Uh, Joe said to me many, many times, uh, Timothy, you never know who's listening. And that's the truth. Uh, yeah. When I, when, you know, the second time through uh, with the Cavs position, I was amazed how many people within the organization had listened to me, mm -hmm. uh, whether they lived on the West side and just like to listen to high school basketball, or if they had a, a nephew or a niece that was playing for some team, they were like, yeah, we know this guy. We've listened to him. So again, if I'm sitting in a gym at Keystone high school in LaGrange, you know, I'm not thinking somebody from the Cavs front office is listening. So you never know who's listening. So, you know, you better be giving it your 100% a effort all of the time. Um, and, and it's funny, I'm sure you guys are pressed for time here, but, you know, real quick, when I was putting together uh, audio for the first time I went through the Cavs job, uh, Joe shared with me, don't don't send just highlights. Don't send, you know, game winning shots. He goes, everybody sounds great on those. Send me audio where you've got about a 20 point game in the third quarter and you're trying to keep it interesting and you're <laughs> trying to keep those listeners locked in because that's the mark of a pro. So. Mm -hmm. Don't ever think this is a crappy game and I'm just going to glide my way through it because listeners will immediately leave at that point. Yeah. So there, there's a few tidbits, I guess, that I would offer. No, I love it. I love it. Uh, and I think that's going to mean a lot to the people listening here. Uh, well, well, Tim, uh, we're going to take a quick break here with Sam Amika, Jeremy Powell, Tim Alcorn here, Cavs on the break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Cavs. Uh, kind of the season at large, looking ahead at the at the playoffs and what this season means for this young team. Stick around, Cavs on the break. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. It's John Tellich from the Guardians of the Land MLB podcast. Be sure to hop on with us to follow all the dramatic developments of the reigning American League Central Division champions. From game analysis to interviews to keeping tabs on who could be the next breakout star. We'll have that and much, much more right here. It's the Guardians of the Land MLB podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. Subscribe here and join the fun. What's up, everyone? I'm Holly Wetzel. And I'm Tigers Powell. And we are your hosts of the Orange is Oranger, a Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. We give you all the dog pound coverage that you'll need to get you through the regular season, hopeful postseason, and I'd say off-season, Tyvis, but is there really ever an off-season for this team? Thankfully for our podcast, Holly, there really never is when it comes to the Cleveland Browns. Don't miss our breakdown of each week's matchup, game recaps, and any and all news out of Berea to feed your Browns appetite. As we know, Holly, dogs gotta eat. Yes, they do. So hit that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the Orange is Oranger Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. Looking for new insights on the Cleveland sports scene with a unique side of Cleveland sports history? Then you found the perfect podcast. I'm John Sable. And I'm Scott Sable, and we're hosts of the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, a podcast about Cleveland sports, but not your typical podcast about the land's sports teams. Join us as we embark on a journey of sharing a unique and historical side of Cleveland sports history with the help of some former Cleveland sports stars and other historical figures. All right here on the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. The r, r Podcast going to be rocking and rolling with you because football season is underway. College, Ohio State, the Power Fives, the Mac, the Browns. Michael Regai, are you ready to rock and roll with some football? Yeah, yeah, I've been ready. This is our time of year. This is what r, &R is all about. We're going to be with you every week. Kenny just said it, Browns, NFL, Ohio State-centric. So you got to stay with us all fall and winter long here on r, &R. That's right. The Red Eye and Rhoda podcast coming to you here on the Press Play Podcast Network. Subscribe now and don't miss a show. Hey, everybody. I'm Gary. And I'm Jason. 
Open his cards as a kid, no matter what was in the pack, you always had that stick of chewing gum. Well, it turns out Gary and I opened up a box of 86 tops last year, and let me tell you, the chewing gum does not age well. Join us on the Ball Card Show, the sports podcast for the sports collector. We are back here, Cavs in the Break NBA podcast. Sam Amico, Jeremy Powell, Tim Alcorn right here with us. Cavs in the Break. Uh, Tim, thanks for sharing your story. That was incredible. Uh, We want to talk Cavs with you because you are with the team every game. We do our best to watch every game, to cover every game. But but Tim, you you are there. And I, I want to start our Cavs discussion with this question. If you could summarize this season, where there's nine games left as of we're recording this on Monday night. March 20th. If you could summarize a season in, in one word or, or the, the team in this season, one word, what, what word would you use? Can I use two? Sure. <laughs> Surpassed expectations. Okay. Okay. So would, would that be your expectations or would you say the team's expectations? Um, Both. Um, to, so let's go a little further into the weeds on that. Uh, yeah. Capitals coming off of a 44 win season. Mm-hmm. Um, and then of course, right before Labor Day weekend, the, the blockbuster deal for Donovan Mitchell is announced. Yeah. So I think the Cavs internally and, and yes, me personally, we're thinking, okay, you're coming off a 44 win season. You've got Donovan Mitchell, but there's going to take some, there's going to, be a getting to know each other process with one another. Um, but to me, how quickly he acclimated himself to his teammates and the Cleveland community and what this team has been able to accomplish uh, has exceeded expectations. And I don't mean that just in the win-loss column. Uh, the way they're playing, the best defensive team in the league stat-wise, mm-hmm. net rating, uh, opponents' points per game, holding teams below 100. I don't think anybody anticipated this. And I always like to do, you know, if I had told you, so if I had told you at the end of training camp or preseason or even before the start of the season, uh, we're going to be sitting here, you know, as you just said, on Monday, March 20th, uh, the Cavs are going to be at 45 wins. They're going to be sitting number four in the Eastern Conference. Mm -hmm. Uh, Number one, I think, 100% 100% everybody would have said, heck, yeah, we're going to take that. And if I had said, would you believe that? I don't know if everybody would have believed that. So that's where I say surpassed expectations. Yeah. Jay, what, what do you think about that, man? Uh, I think I agree with them. I think that, you know, in if you remember in, in at the media day that you were at, uh, Kobe and the boys, they actually tried to temper expectations a little bit for sure. Cause maybe they weren't hundred percent sure. Cause it does take time to gel. Look, it's the, it's the NBA. Right. Um, so I, I agree with that. I think he, I think they have exceeded expectations. I think get it, if you would have told us before the season that we'd be looking at probably the four seed home court advantage, first round of the playoffs, we'd say, eh, you know, maybe, maybe not. So I think, I, I think I agree with that. Tim question for you, Evan Mobley obviously is an, a tremendous talent, maybe one of the more talented big men to come in the league in the last five years. Who does he remind you of? Is there a player past or present that Evan Mobley's game reminds you of? I think right out of the shoot, uh, I would say Bosch. I know there were a lot of comparisons to Bosch. The thing that I find interesting is that he seems so comfortable at that center spot which of course is where he played at USC and, and not that he's not comfortable out on the wing or as a forward, but uh, I see him developing that inside game a lot more. So I think exactly. that's where his future lies. And I don't mean that in the sense of he's going to displace Jared Allen, but uh, so I'm not sure, you know, when you look at that hybrid type player uh, mm. who it would be, but uh, I think the sky's the limit for Evan Mobley. I think his trajectory, uh, at some point, he'll be the best player on this Cavalier team. He isn't right now, uh, but he's only in his second year. He still has a lot of skill development in, ahead of him. And I think at some point, once Evan gets to that elite superstar status, is when you'll be talking about the Cavaliers competing for NBA championships. So, Tim, my dream of Point Mobley is I need to not – I need to stop with those sweet dreams of seeing Point Mobley on the court. 
Because that's my dream. Point unleash Point Mobley. Let's see it. I need to let that go. Let that out to pasture. It, it, you know, it honestly feels like though, Tim. See if you, if you agree with this, and I've tweeted about this a little bit and talked about it on here. That once they started using him more as a traditional big man post player is when his game really took off this year. You yeah. know, there was some talk early that maybe he hadn't taken as big a step as people thought from year one to year two. But it feels like when he started playing more like you said, more like a center, a traditional post player on the offensive end, his game really did uh, seem to take off. You agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, I love that little hook shot that he's developed in the lane. I love that little turnaround bank shot uh, that he's working on and is developing uh, to the left of the lane or to the right of the lane. You can see his offensive game developing. You can also see him, which I think we all anticipated, but he's getting physically stronger. Uh, mm, he yes. has really gone to work in the in the weight room. So uh, when he gets down in the in the tall timber, as Joe used to call it, uh, <laughs> when he's down there banging bodies. Uh, it doesn't impact him like it did last year. And I think he's also learning the NBA game, and that takes time. Uh, I think if you go back and look at video of Evan last year, uh, he would shy away from contact. Well, now he's lifting weights. He's getting bigger. He'll lower his body into the defender, or he'll take advantage of, uh, if he has a mismatch down in that low block. So uh, I think you're seeing a, a maturation both physically and mentally uh, with Evan Mobley. Tim, how much has chemistry like impacted the team this year? Because I, I, I don't think they would have exceeded those expectations you talked about if they didn't have incredible chemistry uh, just, just from the jump. And it seemed like that, that's been another kind of reoccurring theme throughout the year. Absolutely. You're you're 100 percent correct on that. Uh, and I'm I'm not saying that just because I work for the Cavaliers and, and they signed yeah, my yeah. paycheck. Uh, this is a very tight group. They get along very, very well. Uh, practice sessions on the bus at the hotel. Uh, they're hanging out together. They're eating dinner together. Uh, there's a lot of chatter on the bus uh, as those guys are chatting with one another. Uh, it's a very tight group. And, and we've all been around teams and it doesn't matter what the level, NBA, college, high school, uh, if if there's a cancer on the team or if there's an issue with the team, you can feel it. Uh, mm -hmm. You just know it. And that's not the case with this basketball club. They are very, very tight. And again, I go back to the comments I made earlier about the acquisition of Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell, to his credit, didn't come in here going, I'm a three-time All-Star. I'm going to be the face of this franchise. I'm going to be the guy Donovan Mitchell came in and said, what do I need to do to become a member of this team, to join this brotherhood, uh, if you want to phrase it that way, that you guys have established? And so uh, I think once he showed them that I want to be a part of what you're doing, I don't need all of you guys to follow me. I want to join with you. Uh, I think that was huge, and I think that played a, a big impact insofar as the chemistry of the team this year. Not that they weren't tight last year, but right. uh, it certainly helped it going forward. Sam, are, are, are you surprised or not surprised that uh, re the release of Kevin Love didn't impact the team's chemistry? It, didn't, it doesn't seem to impact the team's chemistry. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily surprised. I think that it was kind of a – because it was there was very little drama. You know, mm -hmm. there was, it was very professional – in the way that he was let go um, and, and he had good rapport with his teammates and, you know, Evan Mobley, Garland, those guys all said, yeah, we're bombed. But, you know, we also understand from both points of view, from both Kevin's and from the Cavs. So mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I'm not surprised. And, and it kind of goes back to what the, what Tim was talking about, kind of the culture around the team, you know, what starts with Kobe Altman and JB Bickerstaff yeah. and, you know, the rest of the front office and the, and the players, they, they've, they really have acquired players. One time I asked Greg Popovich and, it, and, and I, I said, you know, the Spurs never really have any of that kind of NBA drama. This of course was before DeMar DeRozan demanded a trade back in the day and Kawhi Leonard wanted a trade, but. LaMarcus Aldridge. Know, yeah. LaMarcus Aldridge. Well, <laughs> at one point, this is like 2014, but it really, it really kind of stuck with me. And it, it seems to be relatable to today's calves. Greg Popovich says, 
we draft players and go after players who have gotten over themselves. And as good as Donovan Mitchell is, that's the kind of guy he was. You know, I was impressed with Mitchell before he ever came to the Cavs, not just as a player, but when Utah this summer was gutting the roster, hiring a, a first-time head coach, um, you know, and, and, and making it clear we're, we're going through a rebuilding stage. Donovan Mitchell not only didn't ask for a trade or seek a trade, he made it clear, look, I'm, I'm here. I'm under contract with you guys. I'm here. I'm going to play my best and play my hardest regardless. And he made that very clear. And, you know, a lot of times and today, understandably so, a star player is going to say, look, I want nothing to do with this situation where you're rebuilding and trading all of the veteran players. Um, and, and, and so before Donovan Mitchell ever even got to Cleveland, I was very impressed with that. And then when he showed up, you could see, yeah, that's for real. He's really that kind of guy. And uh, I think that goes a long way toward, you know, when situations like the Kevin Love situation arise that, yeah, you're disappointed that that maybe he didn't, you know, he wasn't here for the end end of it, uh, end of this run this season. But at the same time, your culture is strong enough, your your foundation is strong enough that it doesn't disrupt anything. So uh, now it didn't really surprise me, Chase, to be real honest with you. I got a question for Tim and Sam, see what you guys think about this. Do you think if the Cavs knew now what they knew then – with maybe Dean Wade not quite playing up to what they thought, a little having a little depth issue in the front court. Do you think they still would have let Kevin Love go? Dan, you want to start? Go ahead. Uh, do I think they still would have let Kevin Love go if they were having the that that Dean Wade was kind of struggling? Yeah, and they and um, they didn't maybe they're. I, I think it's a fair uh, assessment to say maybe they're missing a little depth in the front court currently. Yeah. Um, well, do you think if they knew that then what they know now would they still have let Kevin Love go? I, I think they would have, um, and I, I I think that there's, you know, part of it is sometimes when guys are struggling, maybe Dean's laboring a little bit because his in injury might be lingering. Sometimes mm -hmm. you just gotta let guys play out of. Them things out of situations you know and, and and not give up that not give up on a player uh just because he's had a bad three weeks or so you know and I think that that's part of a building a strong foundation too especially a younger guy kind of like Dean Wade um and, and and as a team have they suffered I don't think so you know Jeremy I think that they're they're about where they they're where they hope you know, I think they're 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 even better than they hoped. You you think about okay, yeah, we've got for the Cavaliers, we've got the number four seed. We've got an opportunity to get out of the first round because we're going to probably have home court advantage in the first round. And you know, look, maybe if Brooklyn didn't blow up the team, then we're in a different spot. But here we are right now. We're in a very good spot. We're 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 playing well. You could compare this year's team to last year's team after the all-star break when Jared Allen went down, it's a whole different ball game, you know? So yep. um, I think big picture wise, and that's kind of what they're looking at this year. Well, we were probably going to part with Kevin after the season anyway, you know, we were going to use that next transactional phase over the summer to, to bring somebody new in. So um, I, I, I think that they're, you know, they're still looking to upgrade in the front court. It just happened a little sooner than they wanted. And, and, and yeah, I mean, if, if Dean Wade had been struggling this much and, and kind of been playing uneven like he is a little bit now, then, then yeah, maybe they would have reconsidered to wait till the end of the season. But I don't, I don't think it would have been – if Kevin if Kevin wanted a buyout, I'm, I'm sure they would have given him one. Yeah, and just to add to that, uh, I thought both sides handled what could have been a very, very difficult situation – Yes. Well, uh, you didn't hear any sources close to Kevin Love or, you know, <laughs> Kevin Love is supposedly very unhappy. So Kevin pretty much kept his emotions intact and really didn't go, you know, crying or whining to anybody. He's the ultra competitor. He wants to play. Uh, the guy may end up in the Hall of Fame. So he's an elite. He was an elite player in the NBA. And. And the only thing that I would say is that 
you can't really look at it in a hindsight 2020 because it wasn't like Kevin Love was playing. He was getting playing yeah. time, and then they let him go or didn't play him anymore is a better way to frame it and, and say it because yes. they, they didn't play him a lot and then say, well, now we're going to bench you for Dean Wade. Kevin wasn't playing anyway, yeah. right? So uh-huh. that's why Dean Wade was getting that playing time, and, and Kevin – not playing is what led to him going to the front office and saying, I want to play, you know, I want to play somewhere. And I thought the front office handled it well and saying (laughs) everything you've done for this organization, we respect that. We appreciate that. uh, And we'll work with you on that. Man, Tim talking about the team expectations at the start of the season, Donovan Mitchell's chemistry and Kevin Love Hall of Fame pedigree. You'd fit right into Cavs of the break. That's pretty much been what we've talking about, man. You're right there with us, bro. It's it's great. It's great. Um, so so here we are in just a few more moments here. Uh, the Cavs, as you mentioned, Tim, are fourth in the East. Uh, looking at home court advantage or staring at you know square in the face. We are two and a half games over the Knicks, uh, who are in the fifth seed. Um, Tim, they lost tonight, by the way. Do you think the cast can get the 53 wins? We haven't hit the 53 win mark since uh, I have I haven't here in my notes uh, since 20 uh, since 2014. Do you, do you think we can get to that 53 win mark? That's eight and one down the stretch. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Welcome to podcasting. Tim. Uh, to hey, you got to give uh, Tim some background on Chase. Chase is overly, overly, overly optimistic, <laughs> pretty much all the time. <laughs> I will say this. I will say this. The the schedule for the I'm final talking. nine games is favorable. This really worked out to the Cavs' advantage as far as how the final nine games fall. There aren't any back to backs. Uh, you've got Orlando twice, you've got Charlotte, you've got Atlanta, you've got Indiana. Eight out of nine. I don't I don't know. That's that's pretty pretty tough to gauge, but uh, I do like the way these final nine games are set up. Uh I, I will say this, and again, I'm just saying this as Tim Elcor, not as a <laughs> Cavs employee, but I will say that March 31st game against the Knicks, to me, that mm-hmm. shapes up as a huge huge yes sir game that's gonna that's in my opinion that's gonna be the one that's gonna tell everybody where we're gonna finish where they're gonna finish you know if the Cavs get that one now you split the four games between the Knicks and Mm -hmm. good lord look out for a first round best of seven series between the Cavs and the Knicks that could be a lot of fun I don't know about eight out of nine well we'll come back down to earth we're we're in the podcast stratosphere there at the 53 but you feeling good at maybe 50 wins can we at least Okay, that that's yeah. a little more, and no one can see, but everyone here on the dais is nodding their heads like fifty wins. Yes, Chase, that's the right number. I don't see why fifty. Hey, I look at fifty three. I'm like, yo, that is. I, I'm reading for fifty three over here, and when it happens, because, you know where you heard it first. Let me just tell that's you. That's because you're the kind of guy that you give a million dollars to, and you go, okay, that's <laughs> nice. I appreciate that. Is there any way we can get to? Can we get to? <laughs> <laughs> But well, I, go, I just go it. back to if I had told you, if I had told you at the end of 82 games, Cavs are sitting at number yeah. four and home court in the first round. I don't care if that number is 50, 51 or yep. chase 53. Give me four seed and home court in the first round. All right. So and Tim, one more question. Oh, go ahead, Jay. Uh, real quick, Tim. I, this is a, a little off subject, but what do you think of the NBA going to these two games and three nights in the same city trips? awesome in Miami. (laughs) (laughs) No, to be honest, I kind of like it. You get to settle in. It has a little bit of a baseball flavor to it where you have a a series, even though there's the off day in between. What I like is it gives the guys a feel of what playoff basketball is going to be about. You know, that we play Brooklyn twice in the next three days. That's exactly what would happen in the playoffs. You'd play a game, you'd get a day off, you'd play, you know, game two if it was on their floor, or game four, you know, if we had home court advantage. But it really is giving the guys a, a feel of what playoff preparation and playing a team back to back in in a sense with the day off in between is going to be about. I think it's going to prep them well for postseason. Yep. Love that. Uh Tim, on our last episode, we talked about um, our easiest outs of the rounds and our hardest like teams that we like teams that we don't want to play 
in the playoffs and teams that would maybe be the easiest teams to win. So, th- so we're, let's look ahead to the second round. Cause again, we're podcasting. We're always looking <laughs> um, of those three teams above us. You have the, the, um, the bucks, the Sixers and the Celtics. That's their seating right now. Which of those teams would you rather play in the second round? So we're looking at teams that we feel that we like our chances the most to make the Eastern Conference Finals. Which of those three teams would you rather play in the second round? Boston. Interesting. I think we match up well with Boston. I think the I think the games against the Celtics this year have shown that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think the Cavaliers fear the Celtics. I don't think they fear anybody. I don't mean it yeah. in that sense. But I don't think they look at the Celtics, even though they're the defending Eastern Conference champs, and go, that's daunting. I don't think the Cavaliers feel that way at all. And I think on paper, I think it's I, it's a matchup that I think the Cavs actually fare, fare very well in. So would you say well, that you... Picked- yeah, that, that's that's what everyone but me picked the Celtics. I would rather play the 76ers, even though we haven't beat them this year. Uh, I would rather play. You're, you're trying to, Sam, to make me sound like I don't know what I'm talking about again, Sam. Sam's just fishing <laughs> for me to go on this whole, my whole Embiid thing and Harden playoff thing. Anyway, um, so, so Tim, in a series against the Celtics, would you say we would have the best player on the court or would you still give that nod to the Celtics in a series against the Celtics? Well, Jason Tatum is in a lot of MVP conversations. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's an elite player, and I'm not saying Donovan Mitchell isn't, um, but Jason Tatum has taken it to that next level. Yeah. Uh, I think Donovan Mitchell will at some point. Maybe it'll be this postseason for the Cavaliers, but mm-hmm. uh, I'll tell you what, I'll take my chances with Donovan Mitchell. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 Uh, well, Tim, thank you for taking a chance with us tonight, Tim. Thank you so much, man. This has been so great. I've loved hearing your story and just talking basketball with you, man. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on Cavs on the break. Oh man. I loved it. This was a lot of fun to uh, chat Cavs and chat NBA with you guys. And Hey, anytime you want to do it again, uh, let me know. I'll be more than glad to come on. Uh, maybe we can do one during the playoffs. Would love that. That does it for this episode of Cavs in the Break MJ podcast. Thank you all so much for downloading and listening. Shouts to the Presley Podcast Network for making this possible. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Cavs in the Break. We always follow back. You can follow Sam on Twitter at Amico Hoops. Get all of his works and writings at hoopswire.com and at Wire Hoops. You can follow Jeremy on Twitter at Jeremy and Akron and follow Mr. Tim Alcorn on Twitter at Cavs Alcorn. Uh, Tim, every episode we give away a Junkyard Dog Award to uh, to the person who does the best and and sir i gotta say tonight you receive our junkyard dog award tim alcorn congratulations yes, sir. Wow. let's go wow do i get the group <laughs> picture like the cams do where they all surround you and i get to hold up the medal we even got them look we all got the junkyard dog awards <laughs> at home here <laughs> that's awesome that's so, great i love it tim, i will cherish that Congratulations, man. Congratulations. Uh, Do you have any final thoughts for us, Tim, before we uh, exit here? No, you guys do a, you guys do a great job. Uh, I really appreciate you having me on and uh, I've enjoyed this. Good to chat with Sam again and meet you guys. And uh, again, anytime you want to do it again, uh, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. It was a, a thoughtful, engaging conversation. It was fun. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, Mike Breen, take us out. Congratulations, Cleveland. Your decades-long wait is finally over. The Cavaliers are NBA champions.